Now in part six of this series, we'll take a look at how the Knicks close out the Philadelphia 76ers and also the multitude of dynamics that played out in between the lines with both respected teams. As the series result does not necessarily reflect of how close things really were. And at the end of the day, things came down to the executions of both respected team superstars, their bench units, their coaches strategies with the substitutions, and finally the role players that both teams acquired through trades throughout the season coming through. I'm not going to say no more. Let's just get to it. See, as you can see, the more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. And also, if you stay down here and you never fuck around, you'll never find out. Now, the Knicks started off this matchup playing real scrappy, racking up offensive boards, something we haven't really seen in this series unless it's the fourth quarter. The 76ers were pretty tight on that. But not only they were hitting the offensive boards, Dante DiVincenzo started off red hot from downtown, knocking three of three shots, and at the same time playing really great defense on Tyrese Maxey, as Tibbs stuck with him going from game five to game six into having the responsibility of guarding Maxey. But as far as the interior defense, Joel B was still going at it as he got Hartenstein into foul trouble. But with the Knicks overall dominating real early, let's take a look at some of the first looks that Brunson got from the 76ers defense. So real early, typical matchup, Oubre on Brunson. You see the 76ers send two men on, one away. Notice Embiid right here. He switched. Instead of him coming up, he had Maxi come up on that switch. And now the 76ers rotate. Take a look at that again. Look at Embiid. He should have stepped up to Brunson, but instead, see how he switches with Maxi. So Brunson right here tries to fake dribble handoff, but to no avail. But look at that. He has a one-on-one -on -one matchup with his favorite guy. <laughs> Throughout this whole series, I keep pointing out Brunson loves Harris. One-on-one -on, -one on the empty side. But again, look at Maxi creeping in. The 76ers know this. Maxi creeps up, and now the 76ers rotate. They want somebody else making the play outside of Brunson. Brunson cooking. It's all about the matchups. We see Batoon right on Brunson. So what the Knicks do, set two screens to get him off of him. And he's going to get a nice little matchup with Maxi right here. See that turn? One-on-one -on -one with Maxi. So the 76ers want someone else outside of Brunson to make a play. And now Batoon double teams to force someone else to make something happen. Game six right here. It's all about the execution. Oubre still bothering Brunson. Brunson has a step on him, keeps him behind him. It's all about the execution, baby. Brunson making a case of MVP right there. And that execution is really what gets you to the next round, despite what the defense is throwing at you. And Brunson in this first half at a high level, just executed perfectly from mid-range, despite the coverage. Brunson right here, once again, hunting for Tobias Harris. <laughs> He's going to get him on that switch, and now he can go to work. This is his shot right here. Decent look, but he doesn't convert right there. He's going to try to set the screen right here, but also check out Embiid. He's trying to hedge. As soon as he hedges, you already know what to do. IH got to gotta go screen that. A little bit too wide, but this leaves the 76ers defender scrambling. Now, Maxi coming off of that hot game five only had two points in the first half in this matchup here. Dante right here has a responsibility in not letting him turn right. So proper hedge right here. And now he forces him into Hartenstein and he also forces him into OG right here. You got him here waiting for you. Not as good as a finisher going to his left. Now Dante does a good job right here, not letting Maxi go to his right. Now check out OG the whole time. He's waiting for Maxi down low. So right here with the MB pick and roll up top, this is where Tyrese Maxey has to improve. Again, he only had two points in the first half right here, but his passing overall, just finding the guys open, this has to improve. Only two assists in the whole half. So two points, Mitch keeps his hand up and deflects the pass. Let's check out Maxey, still early in his career. He's still going through his progressions as a young player, but from time to time, he does miss his corner shooters. He does tend to overlook them and take the more difficult shot. 
So Tyrese right here in transition. You're going to see him miss this shooter. Look at Tobias Harris. Got his hands up. Where you at? Tyrese already loses the ball. So you're seeing that this is something he does consistently. But again, as a young player, you'll progress through this. So with Joel Embiid right now, the conundrum for him is to fight for position, not only with Mitch, but also dealing with Hartenstein as well as OG. And when it comes to Mitchell Robinson, there's something about Mitch that he does not want to drive on. He keeps settling. Once again, right here, pay attention to Mitch and Embiid. Mitch not letting him get to his spots. Another fucked up pass. Embiid, something about his face-up game is off. Now with Embiid jockeying for position with Mitch, he's going to counter with Buddy Heald. As the Sixers needed someone desperately to knock down shots from the perimeter outside of Tyrese Maxey. So with Buddy Heald on fire at the current moment, as we'll take a look at OG and Embiid battle out down low, it's going to be real hard to double team Embiid because you're going to have to respect the five out spacing from the 76ers with Kelly Oubre, Tyrese Maxey, and Buddy Hill. So that double team on the elbows and anywhere around the paint, it's going to be a lot harder for the Knicks to execute on. Now right here, Embiid tries to punish the Knicks for sending that weak side help by hitting Buddy Hill. But it doesn't work, but Embiid is able to draw the foul. So the 76ers right here able to generate offense out of OG making this double team, which is gonna leave, which is gonna leave the rotational Knicks players scrambling, and it's gonna lead to some Philadelphia 76ers offense. Now with the 76ers perimeter players making shots, we can see Embiid get into a bag that he has done all throughout the regular season, and that is to be a playmaker to start getting the 76ers to generate offense out of the Knicks players rotating off his double teams. So with the Knicks getting burned in rotation, now Embiid could start to dominate. Look at everyone, they're hesitant <laughs> to send that double team. Yeah, just Embiid's gonna dominate Hartenstein from that position. The five out offense looks completely different when the 76ers have players outside of Embiid just making shots. So key takeaways of the first half, when Joel Embiid had went out in that first quarter to get the shots on his knee, the Knicks were not able to take advantage in that three-minute span as the 76ers scored 13 points on 57% shooting, only on seven attempts. Meanwhile, not only the Knicks had more attempts on goal, but they were not able to convert on the four offensive rebounds they got as they shot 36% with only 10 points. So the 76ers started mounting a comeback while Embiid went out in that first quarter, and that's due to Nick Batum hitting two three-point shots as well as Cameron Payne. Now in the second quarter, Jalen Brunson had only sat out for two minutes, which didn't really cause an impact on either end. The 76ers weren't able to take advantage as they were one for eight from the field with two turnovers, and the Knicks were 0 for five without a bucket. So even though Embiid was on the floor, he was not able to take advantage of those first two minutes within that second quarter. And these non-Brunson versus non-Embiid minutes do matter because as you can see, Tibbs definitely took Brunson out the game once Embiid just entered back in, knowing that it's a high possibility, it's gonna take him a minute to get warmed up after getting those shots. So it would not shock me in this chess match if each coach is watching each other's pockets. But the main first half takeaway is that the Knicks started off red hot. But once Embiid had went into the back, they kind of took their foot off the pedal a little bit the bench players started hitting shots and the Knicks were not converting in transition even though they had numbers. So by the time Embiid came back in the game, Buddy Hill entered the game and went off for 17 points, contributing heavily to the fact that the 76ers had 30 points off their bench out of their 54 first half points. So Brunson in the third quarter pretty much started off where he left that in the first half, converting at a high level as he gets the N1 to fall here. So Brunson with the hot hand, he's seeking a lick right here as he gets his favorite matchup right here, one-on-one -on -one with Harris. And he gets to his spot, just not able to convert. Brunson again with the hot hand and very interesting coverage right here we're getting. Check out Kyle Lowry. This looks very similar to game one and two. 
His attacking lanes are blocked, and Kyle Lowry fully commits on the stunt right here. The 76ers played it well right there, gave him a completely different look. So all series long, the 76ers have learned there's numerous ways Brunson is going to hit you. And with Embiid way out here, look at the paint. The rim protection ain't there anymore. So Brunson right here, fake dribble handoff. Look at Embiid by the time he gets to his drive. Embiid is not there for that rim protection. Brunson catches him slipping. Now with the Knicks down four, Jalen Brunson catches Batum lacking right here. They've been in a little chess match throughout this series, especially with Batum catching Jalen Brunson lacking at the end of game five, forcing that turnover. With Brunson pulling all tricks out of his sleeve as he goes straight up and catches Batum with the foul. Now Brunson throughout this whole quarter has been carving up the 76ers as we're going to see Dante catch <laughs> Tyrese Maxey lacking as he's paying attention to what's going on in the pick and roll. And as soon as he turns his head, Dante is going to make his cut and Brunson is going to find him. Now Embiid opened up the third quarter making two threes in a row. I don't know if those shots to the knees started kicking in, but he just seemed more agile, more mobile. I mean, he had a block on Brunson earlier, but sheesh, he looks a lot more agile right here as he started cooking in the third. Now, a few possessions later, check out Joel Embiid right here as he runs up and down the court. I'm telling you, those shots he took earlier in that first quarter when he went to the back, they're kicking in right now because he looks mobile as fuck. Look at Joel. When have we seen him run like this down the court? So now he's going to start gaining position on Hartenstein. And he's just going to dominate in the post, making quick decisions too. Now, again, a few possessions later, look at the Knicks defenders. Nobody stunts. Everybody stays put. I don't know if uh, Buddy Hill getting 17 points in that second quarter, scaring everybody from double teaming, but Embiid is straight dominating Hartenstein. Look at him with the little, little man celebration. They love to act different once the drugs kick in. Now the 76ers are going to run some pick and roll combination right here. They load up all their shooters around the baseline in the corners. So created a lot of spacing right here for Maxi and Embiid to keep running pick and roll until they get their favorable matchup. It's right here off the roll. Embiid was open, but once again, he's in his bag. He's going to take a, a harder shot. So a few possessions later, the 76ers kind of run the same play again. They got all their shooters hovering around the baseline in the corners to create that spacing. And then Bede, once again, we haven't really seen him look this mobile as he draws up the fourth foul on Hartenstein. And Bede, at this point, is a problem in the third quarter as he got 16 points. Now, to counter that energy and that dominance from Embiid, we got to stick him on Mitchell Robinson. The 76ers throughout this series, I've always said, they have to deal with the depth of the Knicks. And right here, Mitch is going to make them work for it. As Mitchell Robinson draws the offensive foul. Now, later on, we see the Knicks counter some of that energy by having OG double team and put that Joel and B stamina to the test. As throughout this series, he's been real suspect in the fourth quarter. Now, we'll take a look at some of the defense the Knicks played on Tyrese Maxey in the second half. As Dante DiVincenzo makes sure that he doesn't go right, so he hedges right here. Forcing him back left. Great defense by Dante to keep up and great contest. Man, Dante in this series, sometimes when the three-point shot isn't falling, he makes up for it with some of his defense and just overall tenacity. You got to appreciate the Villanova Knicks. And it's not just about Dante. The overall defense is in sync. Notice how Hartenstein hedges, making sure that Maxi doesn't go downhill. While at the same time, while Embiid is rolling, Brunson will step up. Knows Brunson stepping up. Now we're going to see Dante hedge right here and kind of slowly make the switch with Hartenstein so he can get back to Embiid. While at the same time, look at Brunson. Picks up Embiid. Nick's defense is on point right now. See, Hartenstein got back. It's just showing you how synced the defense is, especially when dealing with the Maxi and Embiid pick and roll around the three-point line. So a few possessions later... Dante goes under the screen on Maxi. Goes over the top. Look at Mitch making sure Maxi does not turn. 
at the same time. Ooh, good cover by Hart. And we'll live with the open shooter. With pain with that crooked ass shot. Now with the clock winding down right here, the 76ers are gonna try to get a pin down screen on Dante. But look how he fights through it. Normally this is a pin down. Once Maxi makes a step right here, it would be normally Mitch would pick up. But look at Dante fighting through Cam and Payne. Not that much time left on the clock. Five seconds. And the beat is going to have to chuck that up. And that was all through the efforts of Dante fighting through those screens and avoiding that pin down on the switch. Once again, right here, Dante is showing his effort. Not really a speedy guy, but he's able to contest Maxi right there for the miss. And from someone like Dante, this is all you could really ask for is to at least make a contest. Now with Maxi, his next level of progression is making these passes. He could have definitely possibly looked to Paul Reed in this move to perhaps take a better shot. But Maxi from time to time does fall into the trap of taking these difficult shots. And we've seen a very similar circumstance with the dribble penetration involving Emmanuel quickly when he was with the Knicks. Now every once in a while, you're gonna have to live with these tough makes from Maxi. This OG is kind of late right there to the rim. That's a nice finish right there. But again, instead of that tough finish, Maxi's next level of progression is making that pass, hitting the open man at Ubre instead of taking this tough shot. Maxi this time tries to attempt it again. Pay attention to OG. He's ready now. So Maxi burst past Robinson. Once again, he hates making that pass to the corner weak side. I don't know why, but he's going to opt out for the more difficult shot. But OG's right there for the block. Once again, right here, Dante does not get enough credit for the defense that he played on Maxi. Wow, what a block. He had no help one-on-one -on, -one on the open floor with Maxi, and Dante comes up big. So when it came to rest time in the second half, Joel Embiid played the whole third quarter as well as Jalen Brunson. But when the fourth quarter had started, Embiid had sat out the first four minutes where the Knicks were able to score seven points on 50% shooting, while the 76ers scored five points on 28% shooting, and in comparison to when Brunson had sat down for two minutes, the 76ers scored seven points on 60% shooting with no turnovers, and the Knicks scored three points on 50% shooting with one turnover. So in the second half, the 76ers in these non-Brunson minutes slash non-Embiid minutes, they outscored the Knicks only by two points. And when you add up the totals from the first half, the 76ers in these non-Brunson, non-Embiid minutes outscored the Knicks in this game only by five points. So this part of the chess match has played out the same going from game to game throughout this series where the 76ers or the Knicks win these non-star minutes only by two to five points. But every point does matter because this series has been very close to the hip to the very end. Make no mistake about it that Tibbs has very carefully crafted Jalen Brunson's rest minutes around maximizing the most when Embiid is sitting and that's the conundrum for Nick Nurse with Embiid not fully healthy and fighting a stamina battle in a way he has to leave him in the game, even knowing that his stamina is not fully there because Tibbs is slowly trying to bleed out points while Embiid gets rest. So that's why I emphasize these minutes throughout this whole series because it did matter to a major degree with game six real close heading into the fourth. So here's some of the looks that Jalen Brunson got in the fourth as Nick Batoon is right on him. And it's a poor hedge right here by Paul Reed. Poor hedge. They try to hedge him, but it didn't quite work. Nick Batoon, this is not really a switch. He's supposed to stick to Brunson. Paul Reed is really supposed to keep him in balance by not allowing him to turn. So Batoon could make that recovery, but really poor hedge. And just like in the third quarter, Brunson is carving them up with the assists. So in the fourth quarter here, it's all in the execution. As Embiid is going to play drop back coverage, Brunson knows that. So he's going to have spacing out here to pull up. But it's all about the execution. That one little moment right here of Embiid with this space, Brunson takes full advantage before Nick Batoon is able to recover. Now in transition right here, Brunson is able to knock down this three. And at this point, this is where certain coaches begin to have that look on their face like they're not playing with us. It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. 
So as the 76ers continue to hedge to get the ball out of Brunson's hands, one ongoing theme in part six of this series is it's all about the execution. Look at that coverage around Brunson. As he's still able to execute at a high level. But that's what your stars have to do to close out. So Jalen Brunson right here shows his high IQ right here. As he's going to bring his defender all the way around out of the play to get Dante one-on-one -on -one with the slower footed Embiid. Look at Brunson. Look how he makes his run. Completely takes his defender out of the play. And this is exactly where some of the stars of today that are perhaps more talented on a physical level. This is really what they're missing. So Brunson right here off this pick begins to execute and just get to a spot and just put him away. That's all it is. Just put them boys away. So the end of the fourth quarter really came down to execution. Very similar to game five. OG after getting an N1, he missed a free throw. The Knicks were still up by eight with 243 left in the game. And Philly, like the fighters they've been all series long, came charging right back with seven straight points. And the game once again came down to execution as Brunson after the N1 make, he missed the free throw to go along with it. That would have put him up by four. But Dante DiVincenzo continued to play great defense. Him and Hartenstein got called for a questionable goaltend. But with 34 seconds left in the game, the role men, like I've said before, were going to play a crucial factor in this series. And Kelly Oubre just kind of being out of position, not necessarily putting the pedal to the metal after that screen of running right back into position to defend Josh Hart on that three-point shot. But even after the make, everything still came down to execution as the Knicks were able to knock down their free throws while at the same time fouling out Joel Embiid to go up by three. So part of that execution is defending on the inbound and unlike in game five, not allowing Tyrese Maxey to have a running head start because it makes it easier to foul him when he's not in the act of shooting. So after that lesson in game five, we see Deuce McBride right here play real close to the hip, not give Tyrese Maxey any breathing space to kind of get anything off. So you see, it's a lot easier to foul him right there. See, there's less separation, easier to foul him. And now the Sixers have to inbound it again. Now, after some Brunson made free throws to go up by three, look how close to the hip they're guarding Tyrese Maxey. No running head starts. See, now Maxey's going to have to give it up. Now, right here on the last inbound, we see Tyrese Maxey not giving any breathing space to run downhill. Watch right here is Buddy Hill right on the catch. He's anticipating Deuce to foul him. So he's going to chuck it up. Deuce actually fouls him earlier as soon as he catches it, but the referee doesn't call it. I guess it's not hard enough. And then Deuce kind of backs away. See Deuce backs away after that on the shot. He's anticipating it. It doesn't go through. Let's look at it again. Buddy Hill gets fouled right there and then Deuce backs off. And then look, he tries to get a three-point shot. Doesn't work. And the Knicks finally secure the victory. So there you have it. This will go down as one of the all-time great playoff series. Very similar to the Celtics Bulls in 2009, Kings Lakers of the early 2000s, Bulls Knicks of the 90s, the Heat Celtics of the early 2010s. And I got to say, even on the level of Warriors Thunder in 2016. But this series really came down to a game of inches. As a lot of things factored in, the amount of minutes Tobias Harris had versus his output, how well Josh Hart was able to come through and play well in games one, three, and six. And even though at times he wasn't shooting well, his ability to still impact the game through his rebounding and his assisting was crazy. And we also got to look into the fact that the 76ers really never took advantage of when Jalen Brunson got any rest minutes. They never utilized that time to put more of a distance in themselves when it comes to taking the lead in these games. But again, there were so many factors. You could look at the role men in this series, the fact that Nick Batum's defense it came through, the fact that the 76ers played less of Kyle Lowry and implemented Nick Batum and his veteran presence, which annoyed Jalen Brunson throughout the end of this series, but he had to level up and was able to execute. Precious Achua coming through in game four, stepping up after Hartenstein got into foul trouble, no Mitchell Robinson. The Knicks continue to make major adjustments, even Dante DiVincenzo not necessarily shooting well in the middle of this series, 
but still impacting the game with his defense on Tyrese Maxey. And speaking of Tyrese Maxey, he definitely showed out in this series. He's still in the early stages of his career and can improve on some of his passing ability as sometimes he kind of overlooked certain players that were wide open, particularly on the weak side corners throughout this series. And Joel Embiid, even through injury, played really well. At times, he was really questionable, not only with his stamina, but also his heart when it comes to testy moments, particularly going down the stretch of these games when the 76ers found themselves down. He's still going to have to overcome and prove certain assertions that people have of MB when it comes to his game during the playoffs. And finally, Jalen Brunson is pretty much undeniable at this point. This guy just keeps elevating over and over and over and just keep proving all the naysayers wrong. And it's all about the execution. The fact that he made major adjustments coming from game one and two with the 76ers just hovering all over him and giving him different looks. But he made his adjustments. And by the time the series ended, it was all in the execution as no matter what they threw at him, he kept leveling up to a point where it's pretty much undeniable. But until next time, you fellas stay safe. Peace.